Welcome everybody to this mock early warning webinar. Uh, hopefully most people who are joining us are here now. Uh, those who are not can join us shortly. This session is also being recorded just to make you aware, so it will be made available for those who have attended and for future users in the NEC users group. My name is Ian Heafy. I'm going to be one of the presenters today. A little bit of housekeeping first off before we then move into the mock early warming warning webinar proper. So just by way of housekeeping, if you can mute your microphones, please, and also turn off your cameras if you're not one of the presenters, just to save on bandwidth, makes it a little bit easier for those who maybe are struggling with their connections. But basically what we're going to do today is we've got an hour and a half to run through with you an example of what an early warning webinar, well, an early warning session could look like. Obviously, we're getting a webinar format. So as we go through this, it's going to be relatively interactive. We are looking for questions and engagement from the audience. So if you have any questions, you can raise them through the chat function. Um, at the end, when we get to the end of all of the early warnings, I'll have an open forum for people to ask questions where you can raise your hands virtually or possibly unmute and speak. Though we need to be mindful that we don't talk across each other. There'll also be a little bit of an opportunity to ask questions between the early warnings, but really just sort of any sort of particular issues you may have in respect of the scenario to be raised at that stage. More general questions and a more general conversation will happen at the end. We have today Armistice Day in the UK, so at 11 o'clock we will be having a two minute silence. So just to be aware of that, we will break at that point and observe the two minute silence. And I hope that you will join with us in observing that silence. So in terms of introductions, said my name's Ian Heafy. I'm a member of the NEC4 contract board. So I've helped produce this latest edition of the NEC4 contracts and continue to work with the NEC developing new contracts and new initiatives around the successful delivery of NEC contracts by users. In today's session, I should be playing the role of the project manager and I'll now let my colleagues introduce themselves in terms of what their role is in their day to day jobs and their role within the early warning webinar. Matthew. Thanks Ian. Hi, I'm Matthew Garrett. I'm also an NEC4 contract board member. In my day job, I work as a commercial director for Costain. Um, I'm playing the role as the contractor in this webinar, uh, Woodstone Construction Limited. So that's me. Shouldn't be too much of a stretch. Um, Heyman. Heyman, you might be on mute there. Heyman, sorry. Heyman Choi from uh, Moment Donglo. Um, so my role is the contract advisory leader based in Hong Kong. Uh, over the past uh, 10 years or so, uh, I've been deeply involving in uh, supporting various clients, including the government in Hong Kong, for their project called procurement using the NEC form of contract. And uh, the role which I play today is uh, the design consultant for uh, the hospital project, uh, which is engaged by the client uh, using NEC4 professional service contract main option A. Thank you. Yep. Paul? Paul, you have to unmute yourself. There we go. Let's get that bit right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all. Um, Paul Morrison, um, HB Reeve is currently um, 40 years in the construction industry, essentially structural steelwork background. I am working for HB Reeve, who are a developer. So my role in today's webinar is I am an engineer and I'm working for Rockshore Piling, the subcontractor. Thank you. And Mark? Good morning. My name is Mark Doherty. I'm a commercial and contract manager for Yorkshire Water Services. Um, in my day job, I work primarily at the pre-contract stage, so focus on developing new contracts and commercial arrangements for use by my colleagues. Um, I've got experience both as a as a client and as an ECC project manager, but um, predominantly uh, working client side. Um, so in this in this scenario, I'm going to be the the client representative. Thank you. 
Okay, so in terms of the agenda for the session, we obviously done the welcomes and introductions. We're then going to look at the background to our fictional project on which the early warning meeting is to take place. We're then going to look at the early warnings that have been notified and then in turn look at these early warnings, have a, a meeting or a mock meeting to discuss them, to try to resolve them. And then, as I say, we'll take questions between the early warnings, but if we can keep those two specific questions in relation to the issues discussed and then we'll have a general q a open forum for debate and discussion at the end wrapping things up for 11 30 uk time as i've mentioned with a two minute silence at 11 o'clock for armistice day just to highlight this is obviously a mock early warning so we're discussing things that have been sort of created for this meeting and people are playing certain roles that may not match their sort of actual approach to the NEC contracts or how they would operate normally. But we're trying to show a little bit of bad practice as well as good practice to help inform users over how these meetings should operate. So I'm going to hand over to Mark now, who's going to take you through the background to the project. Hello again, so the project is uh, the construction of a new hospital for the client Midwest Hospital Trust. Um, so it's a new hospital on a site adjacent to the existing hospital. Um, so the plan is the existing hospital will be closed and demolished once the new hospital is fully operational and open for service. Um, part of the site, so the, the site where the new hospital is to be built, um, has been used as an unofficial overspill car park for the existing hospital, just due to its location and the fact that it was an abandoned piece of land. Um, and I'll introduce the construction team and there's a there's a diagram to follow, which is probably a bit simpler. But um, so I'll be representing the client Midwest Hospital Trust. Um, I've procured Heyman as my design consultant representing We Design Limited, as you mentioned, on a professional services contract option A. Um, we've got an in-house project manager, which will be Ian for today. Um, <clears throat> so no contract is such in place there. Um, the the build contract is an ECC uh, option C and for, for the purpose of this it's completely unamended um, so that's a it's a defined cost contract I'm trying to remember now um, so it's a target cost contract um, so there's a pay and gain there and then so that's Matthew representing Woodstone Construction Limited and then Matthew has in turn procured Paul as our specialist subcontractor to do the piling. And you will note that that's under a, a slightly different contract form. So that's the, the subcontract, but it's an option B. Uh, so I'll just carry on here. So the site information um, wasn't particularly detailed. So, you know, we had a lot of time pressures getting the work started and because the site was being used in an unofficial car park it's very difficult to get in and clear the site to have really detailed and thorough investigations. Um, so what we did is we pieced together the best information we had at the time. So it contained some historical borehole information uh, that did indicate that the ground was made up of soft peaty soil um, from the surface down to a depth of between four and six metres typically after which there was sandstone. Um, and that's what we were sort of looking for to get our, our foundations onto. Uh, starting date and access date have passed, so the, contract, the contractor, put my teeth back in, is now on site and has undertaken the site clearance activities, which have involved re removing vegetation and stripping the topsoil. Uh, the contractor is also relocating an existing water main, which passes through the centre of the site, uh, because that is in the way of what will be our new building footprint. And as you can see, it's all sort of illustrated on site there. So the, the new hospital is significantly larger than the existing and that water main, um, as you can see, was running right through the bottom part of the L shape uh, and has now been relocated to outside of the boundary. I think I'll pass okay. to Matthew here. Thanks, Mark. So background to this particular meeting, this is uh, the third early war warning meeting on the project. 
Um, this is the first meeting that the client is going to attend for the first time. Um, and in fact, it's the first early warning meeting they've ever attended as they are new to use of NEC contracts. Uh, the piling subcontractor, Paul, has never attended an early warning meeting. So they're also new to the NEC contract and uh, they've not been invited to attend this meeting even. Five early warning meetings have been notified to date, uh, which we'll see in a minute. Uh, two have been dealt with in previous meetings and closed out, which are to be removed from the early warning register, leaving three which have been notified since the last early warning meeting. And it's these three that we're going to be talking about in this meeting. So here's the register. The first two items are have been dealt with and they're going to be removed from the register. So today it falls for us to discuss new items three, four and five. Um, the rock encountered at the depth of one metre below ground level. Item four, um, there's an issue with a uh, breach of a consent and the local government are threatening to stop the job. Uh, we we'll come on to these in a bit more detail and five, uh, the clients considering changing the layout of the building. So these are the early warnings in simplicity <clears throat> and we start with um, item number three in the early warning register. OK, so a little bit more detail. The contractor has notified this early warning uh, when excavating the area uh, where the diverted water main is to be installed at a depth of two metres, we've encountered sandstone at a depth of one metre. This was different to the site information uh, that said we should get four to six metres of soft soil before hitting the sandstone. So we've hit sandstone at a much shallower level than we first thought. Um, as I said, the site information said soft PT soil from between four and six. So this is the basis of the early warning and um, and this is the discussion we're about to have. OK, so we are now going to go into the sort of role play mode and enter the early warning meeting. So in the meeting, we have Mark as the client's representative. We have myself as the project manager. We have Matthew as the contractor and Heyman as the client's advisor in relation to design. So the meeting's just started. This issue has been tabled and so I'm going to pick up initially in response to that. So my first response is to Matthew as the contractor, you know, come on. We've already raised this as an early uh, compensation event. We've dealt with the rock or the rock you've encountered early in relation to the new water main layout. Why is this still on the register? You know, having it on the register looks bad. My boss is breathing down my neck. I've got a requirement to close out compensation and early warnings within a set time scale. The more we have, the worse it looks for me. Let's get it closed, OK? finished off the agenda move on no 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 come on look we haven't solved the problem yet we might have agreed it's a compensation event, but what we're we going to do shouldn't we try shouldn't we try to minimize the impact of this or have you, has the client got unlimited budget well what do you mean you mean in terms of where the new excavation is going to go it's going to cause an issue there we need to work out what we're going to do to minimize the impact of this sandstone we found at the wrong level I see the concern being it could be elsewhere across the site. Mm -hmm. So there could yeah. be a cost there. Exactly. We need to also work out what we're going to do with the design and work out what the situation is before we even get to that design. Guys, guys, what's going on? I've got the project manager here who's trying to close out things before he's even fully considered them. But the contractor's just you know, he's here running a claims meeting. I'm not really sure why I've been in, invited. You know, he's trying to drive up the price. He's trying to cause delay. What's going on? We've already paid for this encountered rock once under a compensation event for the for the water pipe. Surely I don't have to consider it again. Yeah, OK, I think in fairness, you know, Matthew's got a point here that whilst we have dealt with it in relation to where the existing water main is to be placed, there is an issue around how it could affect the actual piled foundations for the building. Assuming that this um, rock is at a higher level across the site or in certain areas of the site, that could impact the actual installation of the pile. So it's probably something we need to look at. And in fairness, at this stage, I think, Mark, we need to not get too excited about, you know, who's going to pay the bill and, you know, is this a claim or is this a compensation event? At this stage, I think we need to look at how we can try to assess the impact, maybe try and get ahead of the game in how to deal with it. 
So, you know, I, I think we need to try and look at how we can try to preempt the problem. How can we get ahead of the game in understanding what the uh, ground conditions to be encountered, where the hospital is to be constructed is going to be? Uh, we have limited okay. site information. As you know yourself, we have the limited site information. So maybe we need to start thinking. Uh, Matthew? Yeah, fair enough. I mean, so are we are we talking about the foundations now? Is that the, the big concern at the minute? Yeah, I think that's it. That if we okay. look again at the structure of the building, the water main was to the bottom of the site. We're now looking at the actual building footprint itself. And if we're seeing sandstone at a much higher level there, that could have a major impact on the designs that have already been proposed around the pile foundations. So, Matthew, can you give us some ideas, some thoughts on how to resolve this issue, please? Can you start the ball rolling? Well, um, blimey, I mean, I've got no idea. I'm a commercial manager. Um, we asked our subcontractor, Rockshaw Piling, is doing the design and construction of the pile foundation. I've got no idea if this is a good thing or a bad thing, really, in all honesty. Well, why aren't they here? I mean, obviously, this is a big issue. They're the ones doing the design and construction of this. Um, it would be sensible to have them in the room. So, you know, can we get them in involved, please? Oh, gee. Um, listen, um, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll invite him to the next meeting, for goodness sake. I don't think that's going to help you. I mean, we need to move fast. This clock's ticking on this. If we're going to have another meeting in four weeks' time. There's a lot of things that could have happened in that period, a lot of mitigation we may be missing. Is he around on site? Can we get hold of him now to come and join us? Let me think. Um... He's normally in the canteen, to be honest. Uh, he spends most of his day in there. Let me go and have a look. I'll go and see if I can go and find him. All right, please do. Yeah, back in a minute. Yeah, yeah, he was in the canteen. I've called him up. He's just finishing a bacon sandwich. What, what, what's going on, guys? What? I was just having my butt here and a nice glass of milk there. What's... Uh... Is, is this a commercial meeting or something? I, I, I'm an engineer. What, what's, yeah, well, this, uh, what's this all about then? OK, well, this, this is an early warning meeting where we're trying to look at a potential issue that we've encountered, this sandstone being encountered at a higher level than expected and how this may impact the actual construction works you're going to undertake and your design in relation to the pile foundation. So really, we want to get you involved to discuss options and, and ways to address the issue sounds a bit sounds a bit commercial to me i mean I, i'm a de, i'm a designer engineer so do, do you not think you should have our commercial guys in on this meeting I, I think in fairness you're absolutely the right person to be at this meeting it's a technical issue we're not concerned at mm. this stage around you know who's liable you know is it a compensation event etc this is we've got an issue we're going to we're encountering we want to get ahead of the game on how to deal with it. So we do want your your technical input around that. So really, I'm going to open it to the floor now to look at some, you know, brainstorming some ideas of what we can do to try to mitigate this problem as soon as possible. Yeah, Paul, don't don't worry. I'm also a design consultant. So uh, so I'm, I'm here also try to contribute my uh, design order to try to help say how to solve uh, the issue and we hope we could uh, work together in this uh, early warning meeting okay i i, I mean I, I don't mind helping anybody i mean but i mean this this nec contract business and and this what well, early warning I, i'm not familiar with all this i just uh, if somebody tells me what to do then i can do it but i, I don't know whether i'm still uncomfortable with this meeting guys I think probably we need to do some site investigation, Paul, to see what depth rock is around the site, see if it's a shallow level all across the site. OK, so is is that actually in, in my scope? I, I, I don't know whether that is. Well, it's not at the moment, I, I would say, ah. Paul, but, um, but um, you know, but we we can sort that out. We can sort that out. Yeah, I think from uh, you know, from from the the project manager's perspective, I'd be happy to look at maybe issuing an instruction here to the contractor that the contractor can then obviously pass on to the subcontractor to cover. Them. Yeah, it's not within the scope at the moment. We haven't asked for the contractor to do the invest site investigation, but that seems like quite a sensible move in that 
if we can do some initial site investigation as soon as possible, maybe dig some trial pits, take some boreholes in the areas, we can get a feel for whether this is just an issue at the bottom of the site or all the way across it. So that seems like a, a fairly sensible way forward. You right with that, Paul? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So an instruction should be should should be okay. I mean, obviously our commercial guys will look at that, but uh, somebody gives me an instruction and what to do, then here we go. Yeah, yeah I'll give you the instruction as soon as I leave this meeting, Paul. I'll have that on your desk. Oh, terrific. Okay. Terrific. Great. That well, brilliant. Well, that's great news. So this is resolved. We can take it off the register. So Matthew, you happy now? We can delete this one, please. Hang, hold your horses, okay. hold your horses, Ian. Listen, we've only just discussed this. We haven't resolved it. I haven't even given Rockshaw an instruction yet. So I think we keep it on the register. And then next week's meeting, we'll look at what we've achieved, what the outcome is, what the way forward is. Let's just review it next week. I don't think we've actually solved it yet, Ian. Sorry about your KPIs, but we do need to make sure we don't take things off before we've resolved them. OK, and so is there anything you need from me then? No, we're on we're on we're on top of this now Ian. we know where we're going. We need an instruction from you, but we're getting on with it. Right. Yeah. OK, so I need to raise an instruction to in, yeah, to instruct you to undertake this additional site investigation, don't I? Otherwise, there's going to be an issue there. So obviously we know verbal communication doesn't work. We've agreed it here and now, but I need to capture that in an instruction to you formally and then we can update the early warning register. Um, Mr. Client, Mr. Designer, do you have anything else to add on this before we close it out? No, not really, but I fully support further site investigation should uh, go ahead because uh, I think uh, as long as we get a, a better quality, uh, say, site investigation information, certain that would be some uh, possible impact. Uh, to the uh, uh, subsequent de uh, detailed design development. I think that would be for the benefit of, uh, of the project. So fully agree, spot on. OK, Mark, from a client side, obviously this may increase costs in doing this site investigation, but I hope you can see the potential benefits it can bring by raising or, or understanding this issue earlier rather than having abortive costs of starting construction with a design that may be incorrect. Yeah, definitely. I mean, let's let's get the information promptly and come back to it as quickly as we can to make sure the permanent design is the, the right one. OK, so I'm just going to sort of break out of the meeting now and we're all going to break out of character and just do a bit of a sort of lessons learned in relation to that first early warning issue. Uh, Paul, I think you may be on mute. Thanks for that. Yeah, so so on that in that early warning, I think there are, there are a number of lessons we 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 learned from that, and and it was clear that the the, the subcontractor should have been at the meeting because he could input into that meeting. So he should have been invited. So the key is make sure the right people at the early warning meeting, particularly the specialists, and and also he could have being prepared for that meeting and potentially come up with some options instead of now um, having another meeting, albeit there's an instruction and things are moving, perhaps it could have made um, better progress in that meeting. However, as it says at the bottom, you know, record the decisions, issue any instructions to all parts of the supply chain, but don't rush it. If it means that you can't close it out in that meeting, don't be frightened to say, right, OK, this is what we'll do now and, and then we'll progress the matter. It's it's about assessing what the problems are, giving the opportunity to review as the early warning and then try to find the solution. And and also explain to people what the benefits of this particular meeting are. It's 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 for the betterment of the project and for everybody so that everybody is aware and everybody has the opportunity to input into that process. OK with that? Thank you. Uh, anybody Thank else you. on the panel like to add anything? I just think from just, my side as, as the client, you know, it is important to remember that uh, obviously as the, the client in character here waded in and said, oh, well, what's going on? This is a claims meeting. Uh, you know, Paul had a similar approach when he came in as a subcontractor. This is this is commercial. Um, 
in my experience, that's not what early warning meetings are about. It is very much, as Paul said in his summary there, it's about getting the specialists together, discussing the issues, trying to resolve it as best you can under the circumstances, and then the commercial and the program impact are almost secondary, aren't they? You know, clearly they're always a consideration, but they're not driving these types of meetings, are they? No, and, and I think it's just just to add it on there, Matt. It, it's it's worthy to note that whoever instructs the um, the early warning meeting, the subcontractor or the contractor, the 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 other party can invite others subject to agreement. So if if as with this, if it's clear that the subcontractor can have an input, have the discussion and and invite the others. So it's not it's not restricted to who's actually in attendance subject to agreement of course definitely thank you okay i think the only thing i'd add before we move on is that um you know there can be situations where we do have sort of kpis on project managers where people maybe get a little bit fixated on dashboards that are recording numbers of open early warnings numbers of open compensation events which is great it lets people focus on what they need to do keep a track of what's happening but that should not then become the driver to get things closed out too soon or before they've been resolved that we do need to let matters sort of take their course we do need to often keep issues open on the early warning register whilst we're making sure the mitigation is taking place and reviewing that on a regular basis OK, we'll now move on to the fourth item in the early warning register, which is around a potential breach of a consent. So here the project manager, myself, has notified an early warning that the local government department responsible for planning has received numerous complaints about cars parking on public roads around the hospital. This is blocking access, reducing visibility at junctions, is causing a nuisance to the locals, is potentially causing danger to road users. These cars are belonging to people who are visiting the hospital and also those who are involved in the construction of the new hospital. The local government department has written to the client that this needs to stop, that people need to not park in unsafe manners and block streets. Otherwise, there's going to be a breach of a planning consent, which is going to mean the works are going to have to stop. So quite a serious issue. So back into the room, I've just literally said exactly that to the people around the table and then we kick off the meeting. Yeah, I, I just went down that road yesterday and it's it's full of vans. You know, these are all contractor vans. You know, if, if they're going to cause a problem, they should have had to create the temporary car parking or, you know, do something different. So I, th I think is responsible for this one. I don't. I don't know why we're we're having an early warning meeting on this one. Hang on, hang on a minute. It's not just the contractors. People, there's hospital staff and visitors parking down this. Well, we told you there was a need for an alternative parking. We told you this a number of times when the unofficial car park on the site would be closed. It was obvious this was going to happen. So if work is stopped, I'm sorry, it's not our fault. It will be a compensation event. That's that. Well, hang on a minute. Let's not start again jumping into, you know, is it a compensation and is it not? Who's to blame? Who's responsible? We've got a problem here. I think it sounds like there's, you know, a mixture of causes to this, but it doesn't really matter whether it is people visiting the hospital causing the problem or the contractors, workers or a combination of the two. You know, if we don't get this resolved, there's a chance we're going to get a stop to the job. And now, you know, Matthew, from your perspective, you may be thinking, well, if it gets stopped, we get a compensation event, but you may not, and you may not recover all your costs here. So you can't just duck this one and think, it's not my problem, I'm going to get compensated for it. And I think, Mark, in fairness, from a client's perspective here, you need to think about this, because again, if it's stopped, and it is, as you suggest, the contractor's problem, you're still going to have a delay. You know, you may be able to claim delay damages. We've got X7 in the contract, but at the same time, you're still going to have the job late. You're still going to have your hospital opening late. So, you know, let's not worry about blame and responsibility. Nobody wants the job stopping. Let's be honest. Okay, fair enough. Maybe, maybe I was a little too hasty there. Let's let's not stop the job just yet. Um, I know, you know, there probably is a couple of staff or or visitors 
causing some of the problem too. So I'll tell you what, I've, I've got an idea. I'll I'll message the staff. I can do that. Uh, get get some blanket emails sent out and something on the on the notice boards to encourage them to to car share, use the public transport, and make sure that we're not blocking these roads. Um, to, do you know what? I think I even I remember a guy, Dave, in the local government. I'm sure I can um, give him a call as well and see if there's something we can work on together. Um, maybe to even I don't know sort out some special bus routes or I don't know maybe even a parking ride. Who knows? Leave it with me. I'll uh, I'll have a word with Dave. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Apology accepted. Um, we've also got, you know, to be honest, uh, Mark, I think we have got some of our vans in that street. Listen, we'll, I will get the team together. We need to take some action there as well. We'll, we'll there is a really good uh, bus service. We'll on the team using time being that will surely ease, ease the issue. And I think it must be possible to create a temporary car park um, somewhere on, on the site we've got for um, some some use for the hospital visitors. So, um, yeah, listen, there's some stuff we can do as well, to be fair. Excellent. OK, that's great. Uh, Cheers, uh, man. Uh, uh, yeah. M meanwhile, we also have uh, a really excellent contact uh, well, with the local government people uh, who we've been working uh, for quite a while. So hopefully we could try speaking to them to get more information, more intelligence on the problem so that uh, we could help the team to move things forward. Yeah, that's useful. And actually, you know, our community engagement team, uh, we're getting to know the, the residents quite well, actually. Um, and we've got a little session set up where they can walk in and we give them updates on the project. I think what we'll do is we'll we'll create some um, some communication with the local residents that they you know, hopefully help them understand that we are moving to a better solution, recognise the issue, deal with any concerns they have. So I think what we do is we get our community engagement team on this as well as move this further up the list on priorities for the next residents meeting. OK, Herman, can you, can you see if there's anything we can do about um, pushing forward with the, the permanent car park and maybe if we if we get the design of that completed early? Perhaps Matthew and his guys can look at maybe prioritizing yeah, yeah. that in the program too. Yeah, sure. Uh, we could uh, we could go back and uh, try to review to see uh, whether there will be any indication if uh, we at once say the construction of the permanent car park, and uh, and hopefully the interface between the car park as well as the other part of the construction could uh, uh, could allow us to accommodate say the the, the need the current needs. Yeah. Just, just can I just put in, guys? I just um, isn't isn't there um, you know a park and ride that's only used at Christmas time, just sort of a mile and a half down the road? Could could the uh, local government sort of let us have a look at that, and we could probably say set up buses and have the contractors essentially parking there, and then that minimises the amount of parking we need in and around the site. That could just be for sort of the visitors. And, yeah. and if it was uh, some of the hospital staff, we could maybe a separate park and ride bus for them because, you know, the buses might get a bit dirty with the contractors travelling on them. Just just a thought, guys, you know, just uh, it, it's not being used at all. And I think they only use it Christmas time, Christmas shoppers. That's a cracking idea, Paul. You're actually quite useful. Um, what do you reckon, Mark? Can you talk, talk to the government about that? Yeah, definitely me and Herman will pick up because we've got different contacts. So, yeah, leave that one with us. And if there there because some concession on the cost, then it will keep the cost down as well, won't it? Mm. Yeah, it sounds great, guys. I mean, thanks for that. It's been really useful to have that discussion. Some good options coming out there. Uh, yeah, Matthew, that idea of advancing the permanent car park. Can you look at that with your planning team and, and look at how we can get that into the programme? Maybe give us some options around that. Yeah. Do you think there'd yep. be a, a time or a cost impact on that? Well, listen, we'll, we can we can have a quick look at it in terms of um, we get our planner looking at it, seeing if it can be easily rescheduled um, and we'll, we'll report back to you. OK, so put up in the next meeting and then maybe we can just jot down some actions here over who's speaking to whom to try and get this moved yeah. forward. Yeah, yeah. The more we can do, I think, to resolve this, the better. Um, and obviously, I think there's any sort of green agenda we can do about cycling to work, encouraging that. I think there are some showers in the site cabins. 
So maybe we can try and get some secure parking for bikes or something. There could be something around that as well. That's um, a good idea. But all I would say, guys, we need to be just careful of the health and safety of these vehicles in and around the site. So we need to, I think, Matthew, from your perspective, particularly just look at how we can get some safe routes for this without mm -hmm. interrupting the A&E access, et cetera, for the hospital itself. Yeah. yeah. Good point. Okay, great. Good conversation, guys. Thank you for the good ideas there. So just, again, breaking out of the meeting, let's have a quick look at some lessons learned around that. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, if anyone's got any particular points they'd like to raise at this stage, then please do so via the chat function or raise your hands. But Matthew, do you want to just sort of summarise this for us? Yeah, so what we captured in that scenario was the early warning process all about the teams working together with their collective strength and ability to resolve issues, regardless of who carries the risk for that event financially under the contract. Um, you know, try to avoid getting into any discussion about whether it's a compensation event. Um, it's not the purpose of this meeting. This meeting is about uh, reducing risk and solving problems timelessly. Um, the benefit of engaging wider team to help brainstorm solutions. Um, you know, in my experience, um, it's particularly issues involving third parties and local authorities. There's all sorts of different participants in solving those problems, different relationships through different channels, the community. Um, it really does bring out the collective strength of the team um, acting as one rather than um, acting in a contractual way, if you like. Um, and there's a similar point, take advantage of what each party can bring. Everybody might have something and that meeting, I think, demonstrated that quite well. OK, great. Anyone else from the panel like to add anything in respect of that particular issue? I think it all boils down to the, the management of the meeting and who's called the meeting and, and makes it clear from the outset that what the purpose of it is, that it is to it, it, it isn't about it isn't necessarily about contract, it's about cost, it's about claims, it's about a, an issue that may or may not ultimately become a, a problem for the job. It, it's something that's been brought to the attention and the team have the opportunity to address the issue, mitigate it and 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 do whatever they can to try and resolve the issue and, and minimise the impact on their own works as well as everybody else's works. And so um, that's that's the core purpose of it. And I think that's that unfortunately is where a, a lot of people just miss that point that it is about looking at the issues and trying to find a solution. It's it's that re very much relaxed approach. That's my comment only. Thank you. OK, I think I'll just make a point as well. Um, obviously, in terms of the meeting, as the project manager, I'm chairing the meeting, though that doesn't have to be the case. There is nothing stopping the um, contractor chairing the meeting or somebody else chairing the meeting, as long as obviously the project manager is updating the early warning register as required, is recording the actions. Um, you know, there's no need for a single person to chair it or the same person to chair it. Um, I think, as you're saying, Paul, it's it's someone who can make sure they get the best out of those in attendance and get people thinking about solutions and not doing the finger pointing. And as we've seen in this particular meeting, we have not just the project manager and the contractor. We could have come up with some ideas and some thoughts, but we wouldn't have got the good idea around the park and ride without the subcontractor present. We wouldn't have had the options around Mark speaking to his staff to get them on board and to try and get them to, you know, not park in, in places that are not suitable. And then Heyman's kicking in with his um, options around speaking to people in the local government who he's got contacts with. So as Matthew was suggested, you know, we can get the best out of all of these people if we get them in a room to discuss and debate these issues. Mm. You don't want a, a cast of thousands. You don't want lots of people in the room who can't maybe add value. but given this is all about how best to solve the problem, often more people is better than fewer people to get those good ideas and to get those thoughts and, and options put on the table. 
Yeah, and I think as we said in previous uh, previously, Ian, it's about the right people. Uh, I've often seen that these meetings get run by commercial teams, and it's nearly always the case that it's the right person, technically or from an engineering point of view or planning, who needs to be in that meeting to properly solve it. So uh, quite a challenge sometimes getting all the right people into the right meetings, especially when there's quite a volume of early warning meetings taking place. And so I think careful uh, diarization rotation of those and making sure that we don't have too many separate meetings, maybe group as many together as possible. I mean, as we're all at least on the panel aware that with the early warning process in NEC4, you can have routine early warnings at set intervals stated in the contract data. So that may be once every two weeks, once every month, but you can also have com uh, early warning meetings called whenever an early warning is of such significance that the person notifying the early warning or the person receiving it believes it is so sufficient that they need to have an immediate early warning meeting. So, you know, we have the routine that can deal with a lot of issues, but we do have the then by exception for those really important, really major early warnings in terms of potential impact and urgency. We've got one question being asked on the chat which is someone who's new to early warnings. Is there a defined point where an issue transitions from general communications to be an early warning? Anybody would like to volunteer a thought on that? Um, I, I would answer and say that anybody can call an early warning meeting at any time on any issue, um, early as possible really, I guess. It doesn't have to be an issue that's happened. Um, in fact, it's often better if it's something that hasn't yet happened and you can avoid it happening. So um, there's no set point at which it moves from a general communication to an early warning. I think the answer is that parties should call an early warning meeting whenever they are worried that something is happening or could happen that could adversely impact the project as in, in the way the contract prescribes. Yeah, so if, if it affects if it can affect either the prices, the quality, um, the completion, or any any other aspect that may that may actually become apparent. So it's it's the opportunity to say, hey guys, there could be a problem here. Let's have a look at it, and let's and let's deal with it now, so we can find a solution. Mm -hmm. So um, although contractually that will be the obligation of the, the project manager or the contractor to um, to instruct one another uh, to attend the early warning meeting, but I fully agree with Matthew. Actually, any member within the project team could really uh, ask for, uh, say, the early warning meeting. Of course, uh, we should keep talking one another and whenever there, there's, there's an issue and uh, I think people should have uh, that uh, open mind and willing to, to share and try to embrace to say that the beautiful concept of uh, say collaborative uh, risk management uh, as um, as a uh, top in, in, the, in the NEC regime. Uh, I think uh, uh, other than say uh, having the right people uh, attend the meeting, I think we should also uh, have the people um, uh, with the right mindset. I think this is really, really, really important. Yeah, and uh, uh, we've talked about spirit of mutual trust and cooperation. I think talking is easy, but uh, unless uh, unless and until people, when they uh, 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 attending the early warning meeting, and uh, have some good result, positive outcome, and they realize the beaut uh, beauties of the meeting, and then they, they go back, and then okay, we really, really. So uh, this is really we want to uh, do all together in the best interest of, of, of the project. So I think uh, so. Uh, I think everyone within the team uh, should um, should really to embrace that that concept. And uh, whenever there's a need, and then just talk to PM or the contractor. So go for an early warning meeting. Okay, that's great. There's a number of questions coming through, which is brilliant. Uh, what I suggest, I'm going to park most of those for now, because we can wrap those up in the latter part of the session. We have a more open forum, but please do keep the questions coming through. We will sh go through those shortly. I think just to wrap up on this particular issue, you know, as Heyman has pointed out, contractually, we do have clause 10.1, do what the contract says. And the contract says that the project manager or the contractor are the people who can notify early warnings. 
but that doesn't stop the client, the subcontractor, the designer, either talking to the project manager or the contractor and making them aware of a potential problem that either the project manager or the contractor can then notify as an early warning. Paul, under his subcontract, will also have the ability to notify early warnings to Matthew and vice versa. And then Matthew could then choose to also notify those under his contract with the clients. And there's nothing stopping us rolling together some of these early warning meetings for the subcontract and the main contract into the same session, as long as obviously we're recording the right actions, we're maintaining the relevant risk registers for those two different contracts. You know, when do you go from a general communication to an early warning notification? There's a little bit of judgment there, but when you look at the early warnings, it's may affect time, cost or quality. Just keeping it simple, anything that may affect time, cost or quality should be notified as an early warning. Often better to have more than less, because even if it's only a very short discussion, yeah, you've raised it, it's not going to happen, move on, is better than not being aware of it and it comes back to cause problems later. OK, as I say, I recognise we're getting questions coming through, which is great. Please keep those coming through. We shall go over those shortly. But what I suggest we do now is start on our third early warning issue. We may have to break partway through for the two minute silence, but if we can make a start on that and then we can see how far we get and then we open the floor to more general questions. So, Heyman, over to you. Uh, so um, um, the next early warning um, in response to the anticipate increasing demand for uh, uh, surgery surface in the next five years or so, the hospital management has decided to investigate whether it is feasible to change the client's requirement to cope with uh, the upcoming uh, surface demand. In particular, they are considering to change the layout of the hospital uh, building in order to accommodate two extra operating uh, theatres. And, and we have been instructed by the client to follow up this uh, potential design issue. Obviously, if, uh, if uh, this uh, change is go ahead, uh, the, the detailed design will have to be revised, which could lead to changing the structural steel frame to allow for uh, larger rooms. Uh, meanwhile, there could be risk exposure to extra time and cause implication to the contract. And so we have to work out a clear picture to enable the client to reveal and indeed, they need time to reach decision with uh, their, their management. And so that, that's the reason why Ian has given an early warning on this matter. And now we are here all together trying to work out the way forward. Hopefully, with all identified risks mitigate, if not eliminate. Yeah. So uh, as a good example there, I've notified the early warning because I'm the person under the contract to do so, if you like, on behalf of the client's team. So I've been made aware of this issue by Heyman. And I put that on the table. Uh, so, so, Mark, from a client's perspective, you know, how long do you need to make a decision? Can we, you know, can you decide now? Do you know what you want? No, we don't have the information to decide now. Um, we've instructed him and his team to to go away and look at the various options and to present them back. Um, so we probably need, I don't know, maybe like six weeks. Um, but I guess the the burning concern is that if we are going to go for these bigger rooms, that you know, six weeks might not be enough time for, for the guys who are currently on site to be able to continue with the preparation of the steel work. OK, so in terms of where we are on the programme, then we're starting to look at ordering the steel for the steel frames. We've got the design for that pretty much done. We're linking that through to the foundations. Um, so, you know, how much of an issue is this? Is this going to impact on the, the steel frames, do we think? Heyman, is this going to need some possibly some revisions to the steel frame if it goes ahead? Yeah, certainly. But uh, uh, I think that uh, currently, I think the most important thing would be uh, to see if uh, there's any impact, say, for example, to um, to other areas, for example, the piling. And uh, obviously, uh, uh, we do look into the option, try to uh, to enhance the flexibility of the uh, steel, structural steel frames, the design. OK, yeah. Matthew, where are we on the programme here and what's the uh, what's the situation regarding the steel frame and any related issues? Well, obviously, one of the earliest construction activities is the is the piling foundations. And um, I'm, I'll be more concerned that we haven't already built them uh, by the time we find out it needs to change. So um, 
I, I, listen, we haven't we haven't got to that point yet. Um, if we can make a decision quite quickly, we should be able to avoid an impact and adjust the, any design of the piles be, without impacting the construction programme. But, but I'd have to defer again to my subcontractor, Rockshaw. Paulie, what, what are you, where are we? How much time have we got, do you think? Paul, you're on mute. Yeah. I think he's gone back. Sorry, to I was just having the sandwich. Um, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. I don't think we should. I don't. I think changing the piles would be a big issue. Uh, but I think we can change. We can sort of some design of some transition beams at the head of these of the piles that we currently out. Um, I don't think there'd be too much cost in that, really. Um, Concrete rebar, it's just perhaps in a different place. Um, so some drawing, a bit of design. Just a thought though, um, should, should, why don't we involve the steelwork guy in, in, in this issue, whether we have another meeting or whatever, because um, we've worked closely together before and it might be that he, he might be able to make the changes to suit. It might be minimal. They could have some, some ideas as well. Mm. Mm, What's Matthew, your thought? Yeah. Matthew, do you have a subcontractor on board for this? Can they come to the meeting or the next meeting? Um, I'd have to check exactly where we are. We certainly are we're just at the process of placing that order now. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't we can't get some advice. Um leave that with me. I mean, I can't solve that now um in this meeting. Again, I, I'm a commercial manager, I've got no idea what, what I, the answer I'm... to this is. Yeah, I know. I know a, a company that would probably just give us a little bit of advice. Um, I think they're actually on your tender list, but hey, um, I think they, you know, they would welcome the opportunity to input. You know, subcontractors like to have the opportunity to input and um, and solve problems. They do like that if you're given the opportunity. Yeah, it would certainly help even if it's informal advice. You're not, you know, um, it might it might just give us the confidence that we've got have a problem or we haven't so okay I, I think that's a great suggestion Paul so do I ask them or do you ask them let me go through the procurement process I don't want to um, upset the procurement process um, okay. but let's have a chat outside this meeting Paul we'll get round with our buyer and see where okay. they are with the procurement okay so 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 from my point of view then I just look at this see what we can come up with with the transition beams and keep the piles where they are and I'll, I'll just sort of knock something up on that, really. Yeah. Brilliant. OK. okay. That sounds good to me. I mean, I'll be happy for someone to get involved from a technical perspective around the, the steel frame to understand what the impact is. Obviously, to be mindful of the procurement process around that. Um, but I'm, I'm not an engineer myself, so just help me on this one. I'm more a, a commercial contracts person. In terms of this transition beam, what's the benefit of this? What's it going to do? Well, well, I, I see it. it it's the... It's making it it's flexibility because we could potentially put the columns um, anywhere along along the beams as opposed to being restricted to a specific point as we are now. So and that's why I'm saying if we if we can get a steel contractor opinion, then we could sort of work together on that and come up with some sort of scheme together. Ian, yeah, yeah, that exactly align with uh, uh, our in-house uh, uh, structural uh, designer uh, advised me. So basically, um, um, the introdu uh, introduction of uh, the uh, transition beam could uh, add uh, flexibility to accommodate any alteration. And who knows, further change in, in the future. So uh, certainly, I think that should be one of uh, the possible uh, options uh, which uh, could uh, moving forward uh, also uh, with uh, the worker side, uh, cost effectiveness. Mm, that could help protect the program at least, even if it does change the design of the piling now. But I think it might protect the might protect the program. Yeah. Okay, so sort of adding that together, then if we move to this option, um, and obviously we need to get the view of the client in a moment on this. But if we move to that option of possibly introducing this transition beam, it means we get complete freedom to put the uh, the structural frame columns wherever. So that gives us increased flexibility. So in terms of a window, how much longer will that give us in which to decide exactly the layout of the rooms? Uh, I guess how long until we're going to start actually getting into the detailed design and construction of the steel frame, Matthew? Well, assuming that that frees the piling um, uh, up to be to be 
to be built whilst the client's still making the decision with the next activities it would affect still work. I think we'd have about six or eight weeks. How does that sound from a client's perspective? Yeah, I think six to eight weeks sounds perfect. And that, that level of flexibility is really good. I mean, we've, I think, Cayman, we've already frozen the, the footprint, haven't we? So it's just about locating the columns. So I think this is this is definitely giving me the solution I need as long as as long as it's not driving in too much additional cost and sounds like it's not going to add too much time from what Paul said. So that's great. I'm really happy. OK, I mean, obviously you've got a concern there about additional cost. So um, what I can do is I can instruct Matthew as the contractor to put forward a quotation for a proposed instruction so we can maybe put that on the table. Uh, Eamon, I think I need some input from you in describing exactly what yeah. that looks like. I, I, and in fairness, actually, Matthew, Paul, if you're happy to help me almost write your instruction over what you need me to put into that request for a quotation, that way I'll be right asking the right question for you to give the right answer to, which is hopefully in line with our, our spirit of mutual trust and cooperation that we're trying to engender here. And then I can get a quotation from you in terms of the, the potential cost and we can get that on the table. Uh, Mark, to give you some idea as soon as possible on that. Um, obviously, the contractual timescales for that is like three weeks to provide a quotation if I instruct one. Matthew, can you, you know, do you need that long? Can you do better? We could do one quicker than that, Ian, since you asked so nicely. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. OK, so great. Any other? OK, let's then, I think, wrap that issue up there. I'll make a note on the early warning register. I'll identify what the actions are, who's doing what, and then we can start to get this instruction in place. We can start to look at these alternatives and let's see if we can get somebody into the next meeting to talk about the particular issue around the structural steel. Though, in fairness, you know, Matthew, Paul, if you can get somebody on board in the next few days and we need another meeting sooner than the next scheduled meeting, let's do that. Yeah. Let's get around the table if we need to. And maybe we could even discuss the proposed quotation at that stage and get a head start and get Mark in the room and maybe try and get that, you know, reviewed and agreed in that meeting, if at all possible. I'll be up for that. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, we can no do it in the next week or so, that'd be perfect. Yeah, I mean, if like you say, Matthew, we can just have a, a, a separate meeting, I'm sure. And just I'll mention the, the contractor I'm, I've, I've got a good contact with and see if you're happy that I can have some you know, sort of sideline discussions about the flexibility on the, in the frame. Because uh, with the steelwork, it's all about the material availability. So we don't want to um, specify something that they can't get hold of, and that will have an impact on time. So just those sort of aspects we can look at. Yeah, I'm fine for that. No problem at all. Nice one. I like, I like the idea of instruction. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Believe <laughs> it, uh, uh, I can get my uh, structural guy to uh, get involved with the meeting, try to uh, contribute. OK, great. Yeah. That'll be good. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, and absolutely, Paul, we need to make sure we get the paperwork in place so we can do that or I can do that with Matthew for the main contract, the ECC. And then obviously Matthew and yourself can get that organised around the ECS to make sure everything's all in place and everybody is uh, aware of what they're doing and it's formally captured as the contract requires. Great. Thank you for that. OK, uh, just mindful we're getting closer to 11 o'clock, but perhaps we can maybe just quickly look at some of the lessons learned from that, sort of breaking out of the meeting again. Heyman, do you want to sort of take us through that, please? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. So um, uh, firstly, I think we do need a fully engaged team to de deliver the, the best result for the project as a whole. The team must uh, add uh, a stay in the contract in accordance with the core cost 10.1, with an early warning given in response to the risk matter who could induce uh, extra time cost implication to the contract. And also the, the team should have a collaborative working culture by which they should be open minded and willing to share the issue they are going to encounter without any hidden agenda, which is followed by working together to tackle the issue and to mitigate the risk. Just putting individual interests aside and seeking solutions that bring uh, advantage to those uh, party affected, while in parallel working towards the best interests of the project. At times, there may be a need to engage other people, such as specialists and uh, subcontractor, to get involved in an early warning meeting to help. Just like in our case, uh, we have the planning subcontractor who has contributed the idea of the transition beam, who, which offer a realistic hope for the for the team to solve the issue. Uh, 
uh, too often the solution may increase the cost of the client, but hopefully a wider benefit could be obtained. For example, clients objective achieved uh, with reduced delay impact to the competition. More, more importantly, the early warning process could enable the client to have a better transparency to the likely impact so that he could make informed decisions with the help of the PM as well as other people within the project team. The last uh, piece of uh, um, uh, lesson learned. Uh, so uh, people need to take agreed action in a timely manner after some decent talking in, in the meeting. Uh, I think this is uh, really important that uh, people uh, to, uh, should uh, really um, get involved, uh, embrace, uh, say that um, the concept of early warning to contribute, but after the meeting, I think they should take action. Yeah, so as the contract requires issue any instructions that are necessary to change the scope, it may be there isn't an action to change the scope. We looked before at actions around the second issue in terms of car parking, which was people going away and having conversations, speaking to their staff. That can be recorded as actions on the early warning register, but may not necessarily need an instruction. The where an instruction is required, it has to be given. We have to make sure we have the paperwork in place. Anybody from the panel like to add any more thoughts to that last early warning? Just to think about the, the back to the point about inviting others again, that it was, you know, that um, there was a possibility that some other parties could could in, could actually be a benefit. So look at engaging with those at some point, whether it be separate to that meeting, but at least the opportunity to have the input and um, find the solution, which may mean an, another meeting, but at least the process, it, it adds to the to the process and and is a route to find a solution. And I think it's about back to the back to the, what we said before. It's about feeling comfortable operating in a spirit of mutual trust and cooperation. And it isn't a finger pointing exercise. It's trying to work together for the for the best. And 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 that's the that's the that's the core message for all of it. I would say. And I think it's worth mentioning as well that whilst we can increase the number of people, we can also decrease as in as we get progression through the project. It may be that we don't need the the piling subcontractor because we're past that stage or a lot of that has been done. So, you know, we can add invite people and also it doesn't need that all people come to all issues. You know, if we've got an issue on planning consents. We've discussed before that, you know, the more people, the better in some ways. But at the same time, we don't have to invite all the same people to all the same meetings the core is the project manager and the contractor and then we flex the attendance to suit maybe the particular issue though as hopefully we've seen from this example people can bring ideas to the table can bring thoughts and benefits and it's also just worth recapping that you know i think paul with your position as the engineer not wanting to get involved scared about it being a commercial meeting is it going to be sort of you know something you need to get a commercial person involved in. That's not the case for the majority of early warnings. It's it's a practical problem. How can we as a team resolve it? And actually having technical people rather than commercial is probably a beneficial thing. The more engineers, the more specialists, the better if we have technical problems to deal with. OK, anybody from the panel like to add anything else before we open it to the floor? OK, in that case, we've got some questions coming through. I'm going to start firing them out to you all, so be prepared. Uh, question start with maybe Heyman. Is the early warning register the same as the risk register? Are they different? Are they linked? Um, uh, normally, uh, um, uh, there should be two, uh, say, uh, register we come across in, in the project. And uh, so, uh, in, the, in in for for a project, normally the client and the and then the consultant uh, contractor will work together to start, try to sum up the whatsoever reset that could be encountered in in the project. But when we talk about say the early warning register, I think other than those uh, matter in the in the contract data, uh, that should be uh, the um, the register to cover. Uh, those uh, early warning uh, look, look, uh, given by, say, the project manager as well as a contractor during the course of, of the construction. 
So I think uh, from that perspective, uh, uh, basically it's uh, two, uh, it's, to a certain extent would be similar, but I think the, um, that uh, the early warning uh, register would be a live document and uh, will be keep updating during the course of the contract, depending on say uh, the, the early warning uh, uh, given say, by, by the relevant party. Thank you. Anybody getting to add to that? Only thing I would add in is um, obviously the terminology changed from NEC three when we had an early um, a risk register to an early warning register in NEC four. Um, not sure which the quest, uh, question relates to, but obviously the the main sort of risk register in which the all the risks associated with the project are managed, reviewed, and mitigated is something different to the early warning process, although linked. I think that's a good good point, Matthew, that we in NEC3, we had a risk register, which was basically a register of the early warnings. Mm -hmm. And because of a little bit of confusion around how does that interplay with relate to a wider project risk register, the NEC in NEC4 changed it to an early warning register. And I think, as you've already highlighted, and, and Heyman has that, you may well have a project risk register. Maybe that's all the way through concept design, outline design. Maybe it helps in agreeing a target or a price, allows the client to understand what their risk and contingencies are. That's a document that serves a purpose there. But then the early warning register is a post award, post contract document that is a live document updated to capture these early warnings. They may well interplay with a wider project risk register but this is a specific document needed under the contract to identify these issues that may affect time cost or quality and we have the example on the screen there of an early warning register and this contains the columns that the contract requires a description of the matter and how the effects of the matter are to be avoided or reduced and that's all the contract says that early warning register needs to contain. Some people, some clients and, and organisations may add in additional columns around who's doing the mitigation, maybe around a predicted value or probability as a way of trying to work out which issues are more important than others, which can be beneficial. However, a word of caution from my experience is that when you start to put values, people can get very fixated you know, where's the estimate come from? Who came up with that number? It's twice what I think it should be. It's like, well, forget it. That, that's not the issue right now. You know, the numbers there is a guide for it's quite important. There may be an impact, but let's not argue over the value. Let's resolve the issue. And we need to be mindful of that when we go through this process. Okay, question here. I'm going to fire to Matthew, if I may. Um, the time associated with staff attending an early warning meeting, is that due under all NEC 3-4 options? And if so, how is it handled? OK, so what I would say, first of all, I think it is regarded as part of the general contract administration of the project. Um, whether it's specifically paid for or not, you know, in the context of which main option uh, of the NEC, if we talk about the ECC, You've chosen obviously options A and B as a price contract, so there will be no compensation event for having to attend an early warning meeting unless uh, the project manager gives an instruction to change uh, the scope or NEC3 works information resulting from that early warning meeting. Um, obviously, in target contracts and cost reimbursable contracts, options C to E, um, it most likely will be for part of defined cost as um, people providing the works. So it would be reimbursed in that sense. I um, hope that answers the question. Yeah, I mean, I think I would just add to that that, you know, people do sometimes get a little bit concerned about, you know, are we going to get paid for this, particularly, I guess, from a contractor's perspective, that there's people being dragged into meetings, they're not doing the day job, you know, we're not being paid for this under option A and B, as you say, specifically, or under C and D, they're getting paid, but it may not be reflected in changes to the target. But I think hopefully you've seen from this session, the idea is to bring benefits to all of those affected. And, yeah. you know, early warning should be notified by the contractor for things that are maybe their problem, if you like, under the contract, that are their risk, their liability under the contract, but they're still being raised in the hope that the clients, 
the client's team, the project manager can help resolve that on their benefit. So everybody should think that this is this is a means to an end. There's a benefit in this process. If it's seen as a chore and it's just a cost without benefit, then maybe the process isn't working as well as it should. OK. Uh, next question, uh, Mark, can I ask you to maybe think about this one initially? Um, so there are some early warning notices um, that are due to stakeholder works who are not bound by the contract. And so how do you deal with these early warnings and in the meeting if somebody who is outside of the the team is involved? How do you sort of engage them or, or how could you link them into the meeting? Yeah, I guess it's it's less contractual that question, isn't it? It's more about managing those relationships. So I think it's you know, I think you saw in the, the was it the first or the second example where um, both him and I were saying, you know, we've got a contact in the local government. We can you know, potentially pull on that resource. Um, so, yeah, I think probably the person who's best placed to, to invite that resource in uh, should do it. Um, but clearly going back to the, the previous question, um, unless you're directly a party to the contracts, um, you may be resistant to join if you don't think you're going to be reimbursed for it. Um, so clearly, you know, Heyman's involvement is not direct to the contract and he's been reimbursed under his professional services contract, his PSC. Um, bringing in someone from the local authority, for example, um, you know, the client might have to make arrangements to do that, but hopefully um, you can almost do it as goodwill, certainly in the in the first instance. Anyone else want to add anything from the panel on that one? Yeah. I think it's all around managing those relationships, isn't it? Whoever has the relationship with the stakeholder, can they encourage them to attend? You know, maybe it's a, a rail operator near the site that neither parties directly engage with, but their works are affected or there's some sort of interface. Hopefully you can form relationships. I mean, I think one thing that this is hopefully showing, and we've all learned through COVID, is we may not have to be in the same room. Um, I don't know, I'll, I'll put it to the panel in a second about who's attended an online early warning meeting, but this may be a way of getting additional people to attend because we don't have to have the cost and time of them actually travelling to the location where the meeting is being held, but get them to join via a video link as we're doing now. That seems to be the modern world. Anybody on the, anybody on the panel been involved in an online early warning meeting? Not personally, Ian, but my teams are doing it day in, day out. No problem whatsoever. Yeah. And I think that may be the, the future of trying to reduce the cost of some of these things. Mm. <laughs> but but okay. Ian, I, I think to, to get uh, um, stakeholders involved, I think um, uh, I think it would be desirable uh, if um, people could have uh, some sort of a partnering workshop at some stage of the project. Uh, so that um, say uh, those uh, representatives from the stakeholder could be invited so that uh, they could at least uh, say sense of what's happening in terms of uh, that uh, mutual trust and cooperation under the, under the contract and also during say the, the session uh, I mean the facilitator, facilitator could explain to them so what what what's the significance of uh, having having that early warning meeting I think that that's really important to establish uh, that uh, culture from the day one and uh, uh, as, that, as long as uh, the state those stakeholders could uh, could understand appreciate say um, the benefit intent benefit of having early warning I think that should have been say that difficult uh, to ask them to uh, to, to join say the, the, the meeting I suppose yeah I, I think Eamon you've actually led on to one of the next questions which is a question about how do you get the clients engaged if they're ignoring early warning meetings or they're too busy. Um, and I guess that's part of the same thing around this education, et cetera, and getting them on board. Uh, Mark, you actually work as a, as a client in a client's organization. How does a client perceive early warning meetings there? Um, yeah, clearly I can only speak for my own organization, can't I? Um, but yeah, I mean, early warnings, it's, it's about being proactive, isn't it? Because the earlier you know about it, the, the best chance you've got to mitigate. Um, I suppose just reflecting on the question a little bit it's I suppose it's doubly hard if you've got someone in a joint client and ECC PM role who is still failing to respond isn't it but um, yeah certainly if you if you have a, a separate client and PM then 
you can always use one to influence the other, can't you? Mm. And Paul, I guess from a, a subcontractor's perspective, uh, often subcontractors, dare I say, are sort of, you know, a partly a forgotten party and are sometimes not seen as being necessarily the people to bring to these meetings because we've got the contractor, we don't need the subcontractors. You know, what, what's your experience of attending these meetings, how often you're invited? Do you have to beat down the door to get in or are people welcoming you into these early warning meetings? I think I think initially in the early NEC days, I think that it was a case of um, the very, very few people attended the, those meetings. And I think everybody just found out afterwards what had happened. Decisions had been made and, and that was it. Um, and then it sort of developed into, well, hang on a minute, you know, the, these people who are, who are bringing these supplies to site, maybe they have got, and rather than make a decision about their products, their services, perhaps we should involve them in it. Um, you know, as, as a point I made before, is that somebody can make a decision and say, oh, we're going to move that over, that column over or whatever, and it might mean that the piece of steel now needed is on a 16-week delivery. Um, but if they'd involve the steel contractor at the right time, then he would say, well, hang on a minute, I've got this other solution. So it, it's been quite mixed. But I think I think latterly, I think it's there's been more of um, an openness that it, it isn't a contractual meeting at, in the sense of it's a claim meeting. It is contractually required because we have the obligation to to notify of any any matters and involve the correct people. Um, so it's getting better and the subcontractors that I deal with and coming from the subcontractor background would welcome that opportunity to make the difference. It's back to making the difference and it's all the whole thing we talked about today. Um, give people the opportunity, they, they can come up with these ideas. Some may seem crazy to one person, but another one might just say, do you know what, hang on, that might not be a bad idea. OK, great. Thank you for that. Um, question around, is it appropriate for only the project manager to have a KPI associated with open early warning notices, compensation events? Does that think Matthew as a contractor or Paul as a subcontractor you faced? Maybe Matthew first. Well, often it's uh, often there's KPIs that are reflecting the performance of the team as a whole, actually, not necessarily just the project manager, but, you know, clearly the project manager's got a management role over the whole project and often quite sensitive about the um, if the KPIs are getting worse, i.e. there's more and more early warnings open, very few are getting closed. That is a problem, not just for the project manager, it's a problem for the contractor as well. We'll all be reflecting on that, uh, those KPIs as to whether we're performing well or not. Yeah, I, th I think I think the the positive side is that that it, it gives us the focus to say, do you know what? We need to get these cleared and 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 sorted accordingly. We're, we're very much in a in a a situation with projects etc. that we've got to demonstrate that we are doing the right thing. We're measuring and valuing, um, and move and progressing with with our industry, and and I think it's it's right and proper that we do that. Um, yes, it introduces its challenges and its and its pressures, as you rightly point out there, Matthew, at certain times. But having the right team, the right people there, they will progress these items with a view to, you know, I've got that on my KPI as well. I need to show that I can get that off. And what is the solution I've come up with? It's not just it's X pounds extra. The solution is better. And the reason this is a really important metric is this. There's nothing more powerful in improving the outcome of, of a project than identifying risks early and solving them before they've had a big impact. It's probably, the, you know, one of the most powerful things that NEC has introduced is this collaborative risk management process. Um, management of risks and opportunities is absolutely key to the outcome, isn't it? So it's, it's understandable that the project manager and the client will be looking at are early warnings being identified? Are they being addressed? Are they being closed out? Because if they're not, it's a problem, isn't it? Yeah, I think I think with um, the prevalence of contract admin systems as well, the, there's probably more of a spotlight, isn't there, on you know how things are being closed out on the early warning register, the compensation register, you know, making sure that all of the actions have been done promptly. Um, but I wouldn't see it as a measure against purely the 
project manager is it? it's a measure against how well that, that project and that contract is being managed by the whole team isn't it yeah okay great thank you there's another questions come in um it's around if the subcontractor has not raised an early warning and submits an application greater than the original order value what can you do do you have to pay uh, i'll maybe just rephrase that question to say are there any consequences on the contractor or a subcontractor under a subcontract if they fail to notify an early warning? Uh, Heyman, do you want to uh, give us a thoughts on that? Sure. Um, also, in accordance with the contract, so uh, if a contractor uh, fails to raise an early warning, which uh, an experienced contractor uh, should have uh, been uh, given, then if uh, the issue covered by the early warning escalated to a compensation event, that compensation event will be assessed as if um, the contractor had raised an early warning. So for example, if uh, say talk about the des uh, a design issue, uh, if the contractor uh, uh, on site uh, spot something uh, which will consider there will be uh, some potential design development which could uh, cause some time or cause implication. Uh, if uh, he raised the early warning, then all the relevant party within say the early warning uh, meeting could try to work out maybe a more cost effective option uh that means a reduced impact in terms of cost and time and uh, but if uh, the contractor failed to do so um then uh, later the compensation will be assessed as what he should have uh, raised the early warning that means uh, the assessment probably will be based on a uh, reduced impact on um, on the time and or cost and I think just adding to that, also under option C, D, E and F, the cost reimbursable options, there could be a disallowed cost yeah. for any yeah. costs incurred, which could have been saved if an early warning had been given and mitigation could have taken place. So maybe just one way to look at that is in some ways, you know, any costs that are due under the contract are payable, even if they result from an event for which an early warning had um, the contractor failed to give an early warning for. But then when we look to disallowed cost under option C, D, E, when we look to the assessment of compensation events, there may be a reduction in that entitlement as a result for a failure to notify an early warning. OK, um, I don't know who wants to pick this one up, but there's a question around. Is there anything different between NEC 3 and NEC 4 in terms of the early warning process? I think in it's mainly the terminology, as we mentioned earlier, um, the risk register in NEC3 has now become the early warning register. Um, and we have an early warning meeting now, not a risk reduction meeting. I'm trying to think of anything. It doesn't, I don't, can't remember any other major differences. I think there's a little bit around the discipline of the process. There is now the formal need to um, um, instruct a first early warning meeting within two weeks of the contract date. Um, was it the starting date? I have to get my own contract and to double check that. And also a need to issue the first early warning register within so many weeks of the starting date. So mm. we have the first early warning register, two weeks in which to organise the first early warning meeting. And then we have the routine early warning meetings in the diary at the interval stated in the contract data. So that's really what should always have happened. We're just trying to, if you like, put a bit more rigor and a bit of more formality around that process and also identifying, uh, you know, this change in terminology. It's an early warning register. It's early warning meetings, though they're exactly the same as the risk register and the risk reduction meetings under NEC 3. OK. Someone's actually up some storming there about suggesting we should look at a flexible design for early warning number five to try to reduce additional capacity. So that's great, all part of the, the process, trying to brainstorm these good ideas. Um, I think we actually had them on already about a client ignores your request or is too busy for an early warning meeting. We've picked up on that. Um, someone's asked about how do you deal with the additional costs associated in getting the evidence together to demonstrate, is it a client, is it a change if the client won't agree? I think it's possibly slightly off topic in that, as we already said, early warning meeting, it's not about who's going to sort of pay the bill. Is it a compensation? Is it not? 
it's a problem, how do we resolve it? You'd have to go to then the compensation event process if a contractor or a subcontractor felt they were entitled to additional time or cost as a result. And you would go through the compensation event process to demonstrate that and then to have that evaluated and implemented. OK, um, maybe if I can ask a question of the panel, we've talked about the early warning process. We've talked about identifying risks, problems. The three examples were problems and difficulties. Have you seen this used for opportunities and how positivity can be brought into that process? Anyone got any thoughts or examples of that? We, <coughs> excuse me, yeah, we, we've used it in terms of installation state sequence for steel erection. And um, it, it, centers, it centered our own program and changing the sequence that was already understood so that it meant that other trades could actually access earlier. So it has, we have used it and it, and it was, it, in our case, it didn't actually cost us anything at all. It was just the opportunity to have the discussion and say, you know, with the, with the, with the likes of a, um, an involved uh, contractor, um, like-minded contractor in terms of opening the opportunity for you know, free discussion about things. And it and it came, it just it came as a sort of a side item, if you will. Um, so yes, it, it's it's back to this light mind, it's back into the open approach. I think with the open approach and how comfortable people feel in this process, it's more likely to give benefit. So yes, I have experienced it. Yeah, similarly, I think I've seen it used quite a few times early on in, in projects and in contracts um, to really have that detailed review of a, a baseline program and resequence and actually, you know, now that we've moved from the tender team to the to the construction team, this is how we want to deliver the work. You know, it might be a slight change, but are you happy to accept it? Um, so really just as an opportunity for the contractors team as they're getting their, their feet under the table to, to bring forward their best ideas. It's been really successful. Yeah. I think uh, you know that's a it's a good point. And I think you know one of the things to think about is the you know you raise early warnings, yes, for things that may impact time, cost, or quality in the negative that are risks. But if you've got people in the room, then you could also maybe turn the agenda towards the end to positive issues. And anybody got any opportunities they'd like to raise? Are there any benefits that people can imagine that we could start to discuss with the relevant people in the room? in that brainstorming um, collaborative environment. And I think people could also, you know, turn the agenda to that as part of the process and make the best of that opportunity. Uh, just mindful for time, we're bang on the 11.30 cutoff. Um, I can't see any hands in the air and I think we've answered most of the questions. If people do have further questions, then you can submit those through the NEC users group helpline. That is available for anybody who's a member of that user group to raise questions and you'll get a response, whether that's via email or direct contact. Um, and if you're not a member of the user group, do consider joining that for that benefit, amongst many others. Details of the user group can be found at the NEC website. Just a slight plug at the end for ICE Publishing, that the ICE is producing a range of books. Many of these are specific to the NEC, helping users to get more familiar, better able to maximise the benefits of the contract. So recommend you to have a look at those where you think they may help you and then that's really it for today's session so i would like to thank the members of the panel for their time and effort